welcome guys to our lecture on the Epic of Gilgamesh. Glad to have all of you in the course. Uh, good to see your discussion postings online. <clears throat> I've responded to seven postings uh, last week and you should check and see if I responded to your post. Uh, again, it's not required for you to respond to my posts, uh, but uh, these are some things that you might want to be thinking about. I usually ask a question that you might want to consider further as you're developing your answers uh, about Gilgamesh and your thoughts about Gilgamesh, etc. <clears throat> um, this week I want to talk about uh, some key passages in Gilgamesh, some key themes uh, <clears throat> that you might want to consider. Uh, as you're reading the work and as you're thinking about the exam. Of course, uh, I assign the, the context, the uh, introduction that occurs in the text uh, before uh, the actual uh, epic. Uh, that was on pages 33 through 37. I hope you read through that. Uh, I gave you some context on Gilgamesh, the historical Gilgamesh, the city of Uruk, uh, also uh, some of the aspects of Epic itself, uh, and so that should be useful to you. Again, I also provided some uh, additional helps um, <clears throat> in the course underneath supplemental readings. You can find some additional uh, information about the historical Gilgamesh, uh, the history of Sumeria, Babylonia, uh, etc. I did provide the Babylonian creation epic. Uh, in my physical class, I had some students who asked about creation myths at the time, so that might be interesting to read, especially if you're going to write an essay on Gilgamesh. Um, as you're reading Gilgamesh in any story uh, this semester or in any course, uh, usually the most important parts of a work and the work parts that you want to read over multiple times uh, are the introduction, uh, the climax of the story, and the conclusion. As you're looking at the introduction of Gilgamesh which begins on page 38 and I encourage you to read along in your textbooks with me I'll highlight what I think are some key passages, some passages that might appear on the uh, exam uh, that you might need to further discuss. Um, <clears throat> so page 38 contains the prologue to the Epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, you'll see here basically a whole plot summary of what's going to happen in the story. Gilgamesh is going to do this and this and this. This is why he's famous. Uh, the narrator of the Epic is telling us these things. Uh, <clears throat> gives us Gilgamesh's genealogy, the son of Lugalbanda, and uh, Ninsun, uh, who Ninsun in particular will be an important uh, character later on in the epic. Uh, and sets the prologue sets the pace and, and the tone, the mood, uh, for the rest of the story. Um, <clears throat> we see some key characters we'll uh, encounter. Now, uh, I begin to pay attention uh, on page 39 when we get to see the initial establishment of the conflict in the story. Uh, <clears throat> on page 39, lines 53 on, we see Gilgamesh described as uh, a leader of Uruk, excuse me, as a leader of Uruk who is lording his power over the uh, re over his subjects he's acting like a wild bull uh, it says there his onslaught of his weapons had no equal he was harrying the young men of Uruk beyond reason he would leave no son to his father so it's suggested that he's uh, bullying uh, his people perhaps killing them here uh, unjustly uh, he should have been the shepherd of Uruk uh, so it characterizes a good leader as someone who's a shepherd, someone who leads. Uh, but the narrator is saying that he's not doing that. So we know right off the bat that even though Gilgamesh is an epic hero, he's not beyond criticism. 
Uh, and the main thing here is that he's leaving no girl to his mother. We'll see uh, this later whenever he encounters Enkidu at the doorstep uh, of uh, a marriage. Um, <clears throat> He's leaving no girl to her mother, the warrior's daughter, the young man's spouse, and the goddesses kept hearing their plaints. The gods of heaven, the lords who command, said to Anno, You created this headstrong wild bull and ramparted Uruk. The onslaught of his weapons has no equal, etc. It repeats what it just said. Um, but <clears throat> the initial conflict here uh, that we see in the story is that Gilgamesh is bullying the young men and he's taking the young wives of these young men and so the people are complaining to the gods and so the conflict begins uh, here Gilgamesh is not being a great leader uh, he thinks too highly of himself and, and so the gods say hey we got to put him in his place he's only two-thirds God and one-third human uh, and so the gods say, hey, we've got to find some way to take him down. Now this may remind us of the Tower of Babel, uh, which we'll see later on uh, in, as we read the Hebrew Bible. Uh, Gilgamesh begins to become such a challenge on the earth uh, that no one can stop him, that he can accomplish anything. And so the gods get together and they say, hey, well, we've got to do something about it. Uh, and this will be uh, something that should be of continual interest for us as we're reading Gilgamesh. Uh, begin to consider uh, what is the role of the gods in this epic? What are the character of the gods in this epic? And here, the gods are people who set things right. When humans can't fix things, uh, they, they cry up to the gods, and the gods act as a moral compass in a way. Uh, <clears throat> Though morality is not something that you would typically associate with these gods, uh, as we'll see later on. But in any case, uh, so the, the great god Anu is hearing the, the people's plaints, and so he sends Aruru, that'll be an important god, uh, who created the boundless human race. So here we see Aruru created humans, and on page 40 we see how those humans were created. Uh, on lines uh, 90 through 95, she pinched off clay and tossed it upon the step, uh, and she creates Enkidu. And Enkidu is supposed to be Gilgamesh's counterpart. Excuse me. Enkidu is created as someone who will counter Gilgamesh's strength, someone who put him in check. Uh, and it's interesting to see the character of Enkidu in contrast to Gilgamesh. Um, so, Enkidu is created as a man who lives among the wild, who lives among the animals. Uh, he is a man who uh, <clears throat> says uh, on line 96 on page 40, he's shaggy with hair over his whole body, made lush with head of hair like a woman. The locks of his hair grew thick as a grain field. He knew neither people nor inhabited land. He dressed as the animals do. So contrast that with Gilgamesh, who was uh, shown to be as someone uh, who was full of riches, uh, anointed with oil, uh, and had all of the great riches of the land, uh, more powerful and beautiful than anyone else. Uh, so you see that Enkidu is a conception of man in the state of nature. And that will be contrasted with Gilgamesh, who is man at his pinnacle of civilized uh, being. Uh, so these two are very much yin and yang of each other. And, and later on we'll actually see Gilgamesh where he becomes like Enkidu and it flips on its head. Um, so those are some of the interesting things uh, that you guys were talking about in your discussion forums last week when you were talking about the contrast, comparison contrast between Enkidu and Gilgamesh. And on a larger scale, it represents the contrast between the Sumerians, who were freshly civilized as compared to us uh, 5,000 years later, uh, <clears throat> who look back on what they used to be like in the state of nature. And you can see in this work what the Sumerians thought of 
in regards to the state of nature and, and what they were like at that time. Uh, and Enkidu is the representation of that. So, uh, as the story develops, hunters run into Enkidu, and Enkidu is causing a problem, which would be a great problem in the society of the time. Enkidu is saving the animals from the hunters. Hunting, hunting would be a very important practice in their culture, and Enkidu is not allowing the hunters to work the steps, the step, I mean. And this becomes such a problem that it's sent on to the king of the land. Uh, and the hunters are too scared to approach him. Uh, and so the great irony is that uh, a man such as Enkidu can't be bested uh, by another man. He has to be bested by a prostitute, Shamhat. Uh, and this is a st stated best on page 41, line 133. Uh, he will give you Shamhat the harlot, take her with you, let her prevail over him meaning in Kidu, instead of a mighty man. So the harlot sent uh, to take care of Enkidu rather than one of the great uh, warriors of the land. And this brings up one of the interesting topics of discussion in the work, the role of women in this society. Uh, so uh, we see women praised in various ways in this work, though of course they're uh, their rights are not nearly as uh, great as they would be in a modern society. Uh, but we see the sanctified prostitution uh, presented, uh, Shamhat being uh, a woman who is revered because of her uh, abilities uh, to take the vitality of Enkidu. Um, <clears throat> and uh, she would have been one, one of the uh, uh, known as one of the uh, cults of Ishtar, and we see these prostitutes later on. Uh, they they are they practice in ritualized practices which were very important to the society uh, that uh, focused on fertility, not just of fertility of people being able to reproduce, but also fertility of the land, uh, things such as that. Uh, and Ninsun is one of the priestesses of the temple as well, and, and this will be uh, another person we'll talk about later. Uh, so Shamhat sent to take Enkidu's vitality. And what's really interesting about this passage is the change in Enkidu. Uh, he is this wild man, untamable. Uh, and on page 42, after he quote unquote flows into Shamhat for seven days. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, page 42, uh, he sets off toward the beasts. Uh, and when they saw him, when the beasts saw him, the gazelle shied off. The wild beasts of the steppe shunned his person, and Kidu had spent himself. His knees stood still, his beasts went away. He was too slow, he could not run as before, but he had gained reason and expanded his understanding. Now, that, that phrasing reminds one of the Garden of Eden. Uh, and we see in the Garden of Eden, uh, Adam and Eve uh, take up the apples. Uh, well, it's not apple in the actual Bible. This is something that we see in Milton later. But uh, they take up the fruit of, of the tree of the Garden of Good and Evil, and, and they gain reason and understanding, uh, <clears throat> just as Enkidu does. So we see a contrast between the state of nature and civilized culture. Enkidu is beginning to, this transition. And it's interesting to see what it takes, according to the Sumerian culture, to be civilized. Uh, and Shamhat begins to say, uh, begins to persuade Enkidu to say, you don't need to be on the step. Uh, you need to go toward Gilgamesh and see this man. A and we begin to see why Enkidu wants to come to see Gilgamesh and what Gilgamesh wants out of this. I'm going to stop here and, and pause for a minute. Uh, and uh, there'll be a second video uh, that you guys can take a look at where I'll talk about the last half of uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh. Thanks for listening, guys.